Welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. The Pharmacy Leaders Podcast is a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network with interviews and advice on building your professional network, brand, and a purposeful second income from students, residents, and innovative professionals. Hey, welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. Today I have someone very special, Josh Kaufman, who is an author and has uh, agreed to spend a little bit of time with us to kind of help us out uh, as pharmacy is uh, experiencing an oversupply in one of the best job markets in the, in the gosh, history of the country. Uh, we're in a, kind of a unique position where we're going to have to be much more entrepreneurial. Uh, and where do we get that business sense? And uh, I found his book, The Personal MBA, as a great resource, as a way to just quickly just say, okay, well, before I go spend a couple tens of thousands of dollars on an MBA, uh, let me just read this. And he has some great advice there. And then he also has a new book, How to Fight a Hydra. So, Josh, welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. Tony, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. <laughs> All right. Well, the first thing I wanted to kind of do is uh, get a little bit of background on yourself. If no one's uh, heard of you from either your business books or uh, the new book or how to do something very quickly, uh, how can you give us a little bit of background at how you moved from what seemed like a very steady job at Procter & Gamble to what was maybe uh, a little less stable in doing what you do now? Sure. So, uh, yeah, my, my background, I, I spent uh, seven, eight years at Procter & Gamble, so a large consumer goods company, um, also loosely involved in the, the pharmaceutical health industry, so I have a little bit of exposure there. Um, and I was I did everything from developing new products, so talking to research scientists and talking to people who needed to do things. Uh, I worked in household care for a while, so uh, I actually got to play the role of an anthropologist is probably the best way to say it. Wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Watching what people do, how they how they manage, you know, cleaning their house or cleaning their dishes. Or uh, I, I the first brand I worked on is uh, Mr. Clean. So it was this this very interesting job of trying to combine what people want and what what they need, what the research scientists were able to do, so some new capabilities that that hadn't been commercialized yet, and then the uh, the factories and and the the value chain production line, like how to bring finished products to the people who who want and need them. So it was it was a huge education very quickly. Well, and okay, I. I enjoyed that role uh, quite a bit, but uh, there was part of working for a big company that uh, really uh, graded on me, and and that was uh, <laughs> the number of meetings. So <laughs> my absolutely. my breaking point, uh, I'm uh, absolutely not exaggerating. Uh, there was one day that I realized that I was in a meeting to prepare for a meeting, to prepare for a meeting. <laughs> To prepare for a meeting, four times, like four levels deep is just too <laughs> too much. Okay, and so I had always been interested in potentially starting a business of my own, and so it was uh, the personal MBA came out of wanting to understand how to do well in the job that I had, and trying to prepare for a future in which I was I had started and was running a business uh, by myself, and so a lot of the material in personal MBA really tries to, to bridge those two realities. What do you need to know if, if you're in the largest of the large corporations in the world? And, and what do you need to know if you are just getting started and trying to build something from scratch? Okay. Well, um, something that you maybe didn't mention in there is that if I remember right, you made a decision, a conscientious decision not to get an MBA, but you have an MBA worthy career before you even started your writing career. Can you talk a little bit about that decision and how that led to the list and then all of this success? Yeah, so the, the personal MBA started as a project uh, because I started working for Procter & Gamble straight out of undergrad. So I essentially did an extended internship where I had worked for the company for about a year and a half uh, before I graduated college. So I was uh, when I was going to, into my full-time role, all of my peers in the company had just graduated from a top 15 MBA program. And so uh, I wanted to make sure that I was, I knew everything that I needed to know and I was, I was fully prepared for, for this role. And so, but it didn't make sense for me to, you know, not 
do my job or, or quit my job, go back to school, borrow hundreds of thousands of dollars just to come back to the thing that I already had. I just, I wanted to know what I needed to know. And so the personal MBA as a project came out of, okay, I, this, this knowledge and these skills are out there. You can learn them yourself. It just takes time. And so I started uh, essentially reading and researching as a second full-time job. Uh, I would get home from work or finish my schoolwork and then spend just as much time uh, reading and researching um, uh, all of the business information that I could get my hands on. And so the personal MBA as a project came out of, uh, I was looking for a list of, of things that would help me, things that I should read first, because there's an enormous amount of information out there. And uh, that list didn't exist. And so after I was doing this for a while, I decided to, to put that list together myself. And that's where the, uh, the personal MBA recommended reading list came from. Okay. Well, can we talk a little bit about credential as being uh, success or giving – I guess I feel like a lot of people feel they aren't good enough if they don't – in the pharmacy world, it would be a residency, uh, postgraduate sure. residency. And in the business world, it's the MBA. Can you talk about – overcoming that kind of self-doubt when you were, and maybe you didn't have the self-doubt, but when you're next to the guy who, you know, went to Wharton or went to Penn or went to, you know, wherever and got that degree and here you are without the degree yet you're at the same place. Yeah. So it, it's definitely more of an internal psychological barrier than it, than it is an external in most circumstances. So, um, the credentials are very important in regulated industries, and I would say healthcare is is a shining example of that. Um, there are some times when you absolutely need the credential, uh, but there are you know a, a lot of circumstances, many circumstances, where you absolutely don't. It's it's a self confidence thing. So what uh, what most employers are looking for is. Uh, a combination of skills and competence and results. And so the more you're able to demonstrate that you have the capability to perform at a certain level, you uh, choose to take on additional responsibility to prove that you are capable of operating at that level. And then by virtue of those smaller projects, you have positive results that, that you can show. All of those things mean more uh, to your current employer and to future employers than than any credential ever will. Uh, people employ other people to get results that they're looking for. And if you're a person who is capable of delivering those results, uh, that means a lot. Okay. Well, let's actually talk about why your book might be better than an MBA, which is the actual mismatch between what an MBA school teaches and what most people are usually going to come out as. So my understanding is that there are significantly more solopreneurs and entrepreneurs that are going to be working alone or starting alone uh, than are ever going to start working their way into these larger companies. Can you talk a little bit about how you've got kind of the nuts and bolts of this is what you're really going to need to know when you get out there and kind of put your shingle out by yourself rather than uh, doing these huge cases for giant conglomerates? Yeah, totally. Uh, there are two primary tracks, for lack of a better word, coming out of business school. Uh, so one is corporate finance. Uh, so going to work on Wall Street or or similar career paths within large companies. So uh, very detailed financial analysis. And then the other is uh, management in a pre-existing, already large and complicated firm. Um, so one of one of the things that MBA programs, uh, or I should say most MBA programs, skip almost entirely, is learning how business works from a fundamental level, uh, specifically when you're starting a new one. So no employees, no existing funding, just an idea that, you know, yes, I, I, this is something that I think would benefit the world. I think people would buy it. I think I can sell it profitably. Uh, so funny story. I actually, um, had a, an advising and consulting practice for a number of years, uh, related to personal MBA and a major theme in the clients that I had uh, were actually uh, business school graduates. And what they realized is that everything that they had learned in business school did not cover the process of starting a business from nothing. And so uh, they they came to me for help in understanding what are all the things that, that if the business is not set up already, if I have to build everything from scratch, what are all of the things that I need to think about and plan for in advance? 
And, and so, yeah, if, if you have an entrepreneurial bent or if freelancing or consulting or advising or building something yourself is something that you want to do, uh, business, business school programs are just not going to prepare you adequately for that. That's kind of disappointing when you come down to it that your expectation is that uh, the MBA is going to do it and then it doesn't. So you were tremendously I guess I want to say self-motivated that you did this or you, you had a desire to do this. So let's kind of start unpacking the book and uh, how would somebody use the book? Do you recommend they listen? I, I exclusively listen to books. I've got three seven-year-olds, so just not really the time to sit down in the chair, get comfortable, get a latte and read. Uh, how do you recommend that someone approach the book? Because you have taken a hundred books and put it into one. Uh, how would you even sure. start with that? Yeah, so the the way I currently recommend it is I highly recommend the audiobook version of Personal MBA, which seems a little weird. Like in in a sense, um, Personal MBA is is a an introductory course um, uh, about how what businesses are and how they work and all the things you need to think about. And so. Um, it, it doesn't seem like the, the kind of book that works really well in audio, but essentially think of it as a long form introductory course on all the things that you need to know. Uh, and, and the book is really set up into three sections. So uh, the, the first part of the book is business fundamentals, uh, what businesses are, how they work, and the five parts of every business that you need to think about uh, in order to create a functioning, sustainable, profitable business. Uh, Part two is about people, so psychology and communication. How does the human mind work? How do you work with yourself, and how do you work with other people? And the last bit, which kind of ties the whole thing together, is uh, a part about systems. Um, So every business fundamentally is a system that works in a particular way. And the more you understand about how systems work in general, the more you'll be able to figure out what your current process looks like and that gives you the, the best opportunities to improve it in ways that are going to get the best results in, in the least amount of time and with the least amount of investment. Okay. And so the, the audio version is kind of the big overview. And then uh, alongside, you can pick up the print, and the print works very well as a desk reference. So you know if you're at work, you're facing a particular challenge, it's very easy to open the book up to a, a certain section that's relevant to what you do. And then, uh, you can get some insight in, in five or 10 minutes that will help you with the the challenge you're currently facing. Okay. Well, let's talk about maybe some success stories that you've had in, uh, you do very limited consulting, but you do some consulting. Uh, do you have a couple of success stories where, uh, you've applied the principles of your book to maybe an entrepreneur? You don't have to say who they are, but maybe, uh, what kind of businesses have succeeded from the book and what parts of the book, uh, you used or how that worked. Sure. So uh, one that immediately comes to mind, uh, a gentleman, his name is Dan. And I, I started working with Dan very early. He was, um, or was and is, a, a writer and a playwright. And he was both trying to, to build a business based on, on those skills. Uh, but he was, you know, had the near term, you know, very, very common uh, problem of paying his bills in the meantime while he's, he's working <laughs> okay, on, sure. on this stuff. And so he ended up taking a marketing job at a financial firm. And uh, one of the things that we talked about very early on is is the value of system and process, which as a creative person uh, was was a really difficult thing for Dan. Like he, like very many people, he was under the impression that, uh, well, that's that's paperwork and bureaucracy, and it, it takes all the creativity and it takes all of the joy out of the work. Like you're just turning yourself into a machine. And so he was very resistant uh, at the beginning. So we kept talking about this, and then uh, the challenge was to apply a greater degree of systems and process into his daily work at the marketing firm in a way to to, to be more effective and and more efficient in the job. And so fast forward about a year later. Uh, Dan had developed uh, enough system and process that he was capable of essentially doing a 40, 50 hour a week job in approximately 15 to 20 hours. And his employer wanted to promote him. (laughs) 
you know, because he was doing such a great job oh, and, no. and he was able to negotiate saying, no, I actually don't want a promotion. I, this, this works really well for me. You're happy with what I'm making. Uh, so let's just keep doing that. What I would really like is more time and energy to work on my writing. And so he was able to negotiate effectively doing a full-time job two days a week and then spending the rest of his time doing the thing that he wanted to do. And it was because he was, he had demonstrated both his value in doing the work but it was also because he had invested in, in systems and processes that made his work more efficient. So this sounds like someone who wasn't bound by, I think it's Parkinson's law, where uh, it, you have 40 hours a week, so you'll make the work take 40 hours. Um, what would you say to people that are maybe in the uh, corporate structure, the Walgreens, the CVS, the Walmart, where they have to show up 40 hours no matter what, and uh, you know how do they fit something like this in so that they can start their entrepreneurial journey uh, to get maybe out of it eventually. But how do you make that transition? You had mentioned that, sure, you went to work at Procter & Gamble and then you made another full-time job. And everyone hopes mm -hmm. for the part-time job on the side. But what I keep hearing over and over is, no, you're going to have to do full-time during the day and then full-time on the new job until it can be part-time. Right. Yeah. I think the best way to think about it there is there are things that you can do to make both the full-time job and the side hustle uh, require less emotional investment and psychological investment and energy from you. So what would it look like if you were able to get better at your current job and do it in a way where when you come home, you're just not completely exhausted and just want to watch TV for the rest of the, of the day. You know, what are some things that you can do to, to actively remove stress and remove frustration and re remove some of the low value things that you, you should not be spending the vast majority of your time and energy on and spend more of that time in the high value uh, areas that actually get you the results you want. Um, I, I know the biggest challenge is typically when you're in an existing firm, things are, are, are done in a very specific way. And that way is established before you even get there in most cases. And so it's a little bit scary at the beginning, taking a look at what are the current demands? How, what is the, the current process look like? And being brave enough for, or having the courage to start experimenting to start doing small changes, uh, little improvements, and then doing enough of those small experiments to figure out what works well for you in your current situation and your current context, and what are the things that may not work so well for you or things that you need to stop doing. Uh, so yeah, a lot of small experimentation is, is definitely the place to start. Okay, so you're saying uh, you're still going to the job, you're still go you're going in at the same time, but your goal now is to leave that job with some energy left in the tank, uh, and by kind of going back in and saying, all right, well, let's see if we can do this to implement another system or this system that by the end of the day, you're like, oh, I really, I feel a little better about things. You know, things are getting a little bit better. I feel a little bit more energy at the end of the day. I'm not going to be upset with my family. Just, you know, don't ask about my day, that kind of thing. So that's, that sounds like a, a good start. Can you, I guess, um, can I start unpacking maybe the book and some of the words and, and terms that you've used in terms of energy then? Because I think that would be sure. a good next step. Well, let's uh, start talking about, let's start first with the, the difference between procrastination and acrasia. Uh, people may know procrastination, but not acrasia. Can you talk about those two terms and kind of how they sap your energy uh, when if you were just in kind of a one one stop mindset, maybe you would be able to get through those things? Yeah, sure. So, so uh, acrasia or acrasia is is an ancient term, uh, goes all the way back to the days of uh, Aristotle and Plato, um, and and very broadly defined, it's uh, not doing the things that you know you should be doing, right? So, I I know I should be exercising, but I don't. I know I should be going to sleep and and getting enough high quality sleep, but I'm not. I'm staying up and watching TV. Um, all of those things that we we know. We want to act in a certain way, and we know we should act in a certain way, but we don't. Um, this is the, the fundamental uh, problem of self-improvement in general. Like All of the best intentions really don't help if you're not able to 
get to do or to get yourself to do the things that that you uh, know you should. And a lot of that comes from there. There are areas of active resistance that may be implicit in the types of things that that we choose to do. So um, a good example here is sometimes the things that we want are are overly broad. They're not very well defined. And the more nebulous something is, kind of the more bigger and overwhelming that thing feels. I want to be happy. So, yeah, yeah, I want to be happy. Or even like, I want to start my own business. Well, that that's a very general thing. That could look like, you know, 10,000 different options. So the more specific you are about what you want, in general, the easier it is to go about getting it. Your Your mind is able to simulate what the process of getting that thing looks like in a way that, you know, when it's, when it's broad and nebulous, uh, your, your brain just can't put all of the pieces together and how you would get that thing. Um, there are lots of different reasons that, that acrasia takes place. And a lot of it has comes down to these, these resistances that appear and in not being uh, very specific about what we're trying to do. Can you talk a little bit about the solution that you talked about in the book, which I would believe is this counterfactual training? Is that the, the, the right term? Yeah, counterfactual simulation. Okay. And, and so counterfactual is, is a fancy way of, of saying uh, something that, is, that doesn't currently exist, but we could imagine it. So uh, counterfactual questions uh, usually take the form of what would it look like if? What would it look like if I came home and I worked on – this business idea for about two hours. And I have a very specific thing that I'm working on. What would it look like if I'm able to quit my pharmacy job in a year? What would I do? What would that look like? Um, I actually used this, uh, this question to figure out when it was time to quit my job at Procter and Gamble. Um, it was, you know, what would I, I, I think the, if I'm remembering right, the question I asked was what would it look like if I quit my job by my birthday, which was coming up in a couple months. Um, and so it's kind of the, the, the personal growth and development version of, um, you know, how science fiction and fantasy books will, will take a premise and we'll just kind of run with it for a while and, and see what reality looks like if a certain thing is true. Um, this is counterfactual simulation is how you do that for your own life. It's, you're imagining something that is not true yet, but it could be maybe. And so you just assume that thing is true and you figure out how you got there and what the world would look like if you got there. And so as a general method of both future planning and goal setting, it's one of the most flexible and useful things that, that you can do. Just ask yourself a what if question and then try to simulate what your, what would either be true or what your life would look like if that thing is, is a fact. A little earlier, I think in that chapter, you uh, explained the five whys and the five hows. Can you talk a little bit about the five whys and the five hows and how those work practically? Yeah. So five whys is a technique uh, that has a very long history. Um, it's sometimes called root cause analysis. And so the the general thing is uh, you are seeing a particular result or you want a particular thing and you ask yourself why. Why do I want this or why did this happen? And then you figure out the most likely answer for that. And then you ask yourself why again. And, and you do that over and over and over. You can usually go you know, five or six levels deep. That's where the, the term five whys comes from. And it helps you get to you know, really beyond the superficial causes or desires that, that we're dealing with on a, a day-to-day basis. Because really, if, if you understand what the root cause or the root desire is, your your actions on how to improve things or the choices that you make um, have much more context and you can be much more effective because you're actually getting to the core of what's going on. So that's the the um, fivefold why. The how is essentially doing the same thing but in the opposite direction. Uh, so how are you going to do this this thing? Well, how are you going to do that? And how are you going to do that? And how are you going to do that? And so it's turning that, that root cause or, or the thing that you're trying to do and you're just, just getting to, to more positive, immediate, concrete, and specific things that you can do to move yourself in that direction that you've decided you want. And so the, the two techniques kind of let you 
I don't know, time travel a bit, <laughs> uh, both in, yeah. into the past and into the future to figure out how to get from where you are right now to where you've decided you want to go. Awesome. Well, before we go into the other book, How to Fight a Hydra, I want to just ask about two more uh, techniques that you use, the Pomodoro timer, uh, and then talk about cognitive switching and, and kind of how uh, the Pomodoro timer hopefully keeps you from that expense of the cognitive switching. Yeah, totally. So so Pomodoro, for, for listeners who aren't familiar with it, is a way of, you essentially, you take a small timer, and you set it for a certain amount of time. It's usually, be, depending on the method you use, anywhere between 20 and 50 minutes. And uh, there are only two rules. The one is you get started on the task uh, as soon as the, you start the timer, and nothing is allowed to interrupt you, or you do not stop for any reason aside from a life-and-death emergency until the timer's done. And then you get up, you take a break, uh, clear your mind a little bit, and then you try to complete as many of those focus periods in a day as you possibly can. And so the the reason that works is because of something that I call the, the cognitive switching penalty. So the, the human mind, it really isn't designed for multitasking. It's not very good at it. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we are essentially, you know, we, we, our serial thinker, thinkers, we can just switch the focus our, of our attention from one thing to the next very quickly. But every time we do, your brain has to, you know, to use a computer metaphor, load the context of what it is that you're doing every time you switch the focus of your attention. And so the more times you switch, the less efficient you become, the more you're, you're forcing your mind to, to load and reload the context of what you're doing. And that just takes away from your ability to perform well at the tasks that you're trying to do. It's far more efficient to sit down, focus on one thing, keep your attention on that one thing for a while until it's done or until you're in a, a good stopping place. And then if you need to focus on something else, then you switch your attention once instead of going back and forth. Okay. And the other thing I wanted to talk about, which kind of relates to the way the pharmacy set up. So the pharmacy is actually set up to cause a lot of this cognitive switching penalty where you'll talk mm -hmm. to a patient, then you'll maybe check some prescriptions, then you'll answer some calls. In your book, you were talking about batching. If you were to set up the pharmacy system in such a way that you could do batching a little bit better to make it so you're not exhausted at the end of the day from getting all these penalties. It's like, it's like you've been in the, I don't know, to use a hockey analogy, you've been in the penalty box more than, you know, half the game uh, because you just keep going back and forth, back and forth, and you keep incurring this penalty over and over. Uh, can you talk a little bit about batching and how that might save some energy or how might, that might reduce the number of cognitive switching penalties you get in a game or in a, in a work day? Yeah, totally. So, so batching is basically just focusing on like tasks close to each other. And so, you know, in an, in an office environment that might look like, uh, making all of the calls that you need to make in, in one block of time, answering all the emails you need to answer in one block of time, uh, scheduling uh, all of your meetings in as, as much as possible into a period of time in the morning or afternoon. So you have some time to focus. So instead of, you know, phone call, email, meeting, phone call, email, meeting, you know, going back and forth in, uh, uh, in a way that is super distracting. You're just taking all of the things that are like each other and you're doing all of them in a group. And so you know, one of the things, you know, have, not coming from a, a pharmacy background, one thing that might help from a management context is having uh, some, a, a staff member who is responsible for, for interacting with patients and having them focus on that for a while in a batch while another uh, uh, pharmacist is filling prescriptions and handling all of that. And then uh, rotating people throughout the course of the day. And so instead of going back and forth between uh, interaction, filling prescriptions, um, in, in a way that is disruptive from a switching context, you get to get into more of a, a rhythm, more of a flow um, doing the same kinds of tasks uh, in a way that, that lets you kind of load, load the brain context that's required to do that work, do that well, and then shut it down and do something else instead of switching back and forth. All right. Well, I wanted to stop it there. We're right at about 30 minutes, and 
Uh, we'll listen to Josh Kaufman's second part, talking about his book, How to Fight a Hydra, which is really cool. It's a, it's a quick read if you sit down, and it's uh, 90 minutes if you listen on audiobook. But I really think he, man, he really understood what the real issue is, and it's that we're switching back and forth so much, and we're so efficient while we're at work, that we're so exhausted by the end of the day that we not only haven't gotten done what we want to get done, so there's that kind of uh, self-effacing or you know, kind of beating ourselves up over that, but also we're exhausted because we keep going back and forth and we can't continue with one thing where uh, if we had one person that was really focusing on the counseling and another person uh, that was uh, just focusing on product and uh, making sure that we're not switching so much back and forth. So again, I, I hope you enjoyed this episode and um, uh, do check out our new book, uh, a couple of new things. So uh, strong residency interview uh, questions, a hundred of them uh, in ebook form. We're going to have an audio book that comes out in a month. And then also uh, Thrill of the Case just came out by Eric Christensen. I uh, was able to work with him to produce that. I think both of those are critical uh, if you're going out to ASHP this weekend. But also, hopefully you've taken some advice from Josh and are kind of thinking, you know, entrepreneurially, you know, how does a residency fit as a tool? Because that's really what it is. Uh, a residency isn't a means, is a means to an end. It's not the end point. And uh, just as even Olympians stand on the podium with their gold medals, they're sitting there like, all right, what's next? And there's no book for that. What's next after a gold medal? It really is letting that experience be part of your life and support the next thing that you do. So again, uh, we'll hear from the other half of Josh Koshman's interview next week. Uh, but I hope you uh, have a good weekend and uh, enjoy ASHP and the great weather down in Anaheim. Support for this episode comes from the audiobook Memorizing Pharmacology, a relaxed approach. With over 9,000 sales in the United States, United Kingdom, and Australia, it's the go-to resource to ease the pharmacology challenge. Available on Audible, iTunes, and Amazon.com. In print, ebook, and audiobook. Thank you for listening to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. Be sure to share the show with the hashtag hash pharmacy leaders. 